Let's move to Mark. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Hey, uh, can you hear me and see my screen? Perfect. Good. All right. Thanks. Hi. Welcome Thank back, uh, everyone. Uh, and thanks again to organizers and also to Kashi for a great um, set of lectures, which I'll be building on. And I think you'll see that many of the concepts will tie together, hopefully, in a nice way. I also wanted to just uh, say I, I was really happy to see Takashi recognize uh, the impact that Takuya Kitagawa has had on this, because also for me, uh, my journey into flow K physics started through discussions with um, Takuya when he was a student and I was a postdoc. Uh, and actually, there was one thing that Takashi mentioned about the name Pi Edge States. I think that's one more impact that Takuya has had. I think he was the first to use that word uh, as we were exploring uh, those features. Uh, OK, so, so let me begin by just quickly recapping where we left off last time. Uh, so we had discussed the fact that quasi-energy uh, has a Brillouin zone, just like, uh, and as Takashi mentioned in the previous lecture, uh, just as we're familiar with crystal momentum in the presence of a periodic potential, uh, two momentum values which are separated by a reciprocal lattice vector, we actually identify as the same, and they correspond to the same states. Uh, with a periodically driven system, uh, two values of energy, essentially, which differ by uh, an integer multiple of h bar omega, which is the driving field photon energy, those we identify as being the same, and that gives rise to this periodicity uh, of quasi-energy. Uh, and we discussed that this has some very important and interesting consequences for topology, uh, because now we see that the band structure we can think of as living uh, on a closed manifold, on a torus, rather than on a cylinder as it would uh, for a non-driven system where energy is a real number. Uh, and in one dimension, we saw that this resulted in the so-called Thalvis pumping or quantized adiabatic pumping scenario, where such a Floquet band that winds in the quasi-energy direction when K goes around the Brillouin zone uh, has a quantized average velocity, given by the number of times that this uh, band winds in the quasi-energy direction. And then the last thing we left off with was kind of an observation that I want to dig into more now which was if we go beyond 1D, we start thinking about two-dimensional system. We saw that there's a new possibility, uh, which is illustrated here on the right, which is uh, you can have a situation, two-dimensional system. Uh, and if we calculate the churn numbers, which was integrating the Berry curvature associated with the stroboscopic Floquet eigenstates. So you're taking a stroboscopic snapshot Floquet eigenstates, calculate the Berry curvature, uh, and integrate it over the Brillouin zone, we find it's zero. Uh, and for a non-driven system, if the if the churn number of all the bands is zero, that means that this, this uh, you know, material is, is completely trivial from a topological point of view. And if we make an edge, we wouldn't expect to see any topologically protected edge states then. But in this Floquet system, again, because of the periodicity of quasi-energy, we saw it's possible to have both the fact that the churn numbers are zero of the bands, but nonetheless, there are still topologically protected chiral edge states that uh, run along the edge of the system. Uh, and now what I wanna do is give you a concrete realization of this, a very simple model that we can just analyze and see visually where all this comes from, uh, and then you know, discuss in, in more detail uh, what's interesting and what's topological about it. Okay, so, so to see how this type of new behavior can arise in a two-dimensional system, let's consider the following model. So it's a, it's a square lattice, uh, and we're going to imagine, um, don't ask me yet how we can do this, but just imagine as a, for the sake of a model, mathematical model, that we can just turn the hopping between different bonds on and off at will. Uh, and we're gonna do it in a sequence of four steps. So in the first step, only these bonds that are highlighted in, in red here are gonna be turned off and hopping along any other set of bonds is, is zero while this is on. And we're gonna leave it on exactly for the right amount of time so that if a particle started here uh, through its time evolution with this constant Hamiltonian during this period of time, uh, it would hop with 100% probability to its neighbor and vice versa. If it would start on the white side, it would end up back on the black side like that. Then we turn the hopping off. 
and we turn on this blue set of hopping amplitudes here on the vertical bonds. Uh, so now if we had started, uh, say, on this side, we moved over to the white one. Now we can go down. Uh, then we turn off the hopping. Now we turn on the green bonds here, which are distinct. They're horizontal, but they're the opposite set that we had in number one. That causes hopping in the horizontal direction. And finally, in step four, we turn on this other set of vertical bonds. Okay, so this is a, a periodic cycle that we can repeat again and again. Uh, it's nice from the point of view that each step, the Ham during each step, the Hamiltonian is independent of time. So it's you know, relatively easy to understand what happens. But in total, after these four steps, something non-trivial has occurred. Uh, so let's see what the nature of the Floquet spectrum and the, and the Floquet eigenstates is. So if we consider some site, consider a particle that just started at some site in the middle of this sample, uh, then through those four steps, first it would hop to the right on step one, and then down in step two, to the left in step three, and back up in step four, and it would end up exactly where it started from. So even though it did some motion during this driving cycle, actually it ends up right where it started. And if you check, you can go back and do the calculation, you find even the phase of the wave function is, is zero. So it gets exactly the same uh, value that it started with. And that's true no matter where you start. If you would have started here, then this particle would have again encircled one plaquette, came back to where it started with no phase wound up. So the fact that uh, no matter where I start, I come back exactly where I was after one period, that means that the Floquet, whoops, the Floquet propagator, the evolution operator for one full period, at least as far as these bulk states are concerned, it's just the identity matrix, because no matter where I start, it just leaves me where I was. Uh, and in terms of the Floquet spectrum, the identity operator, I can write that as e to the minus i times zero. So that means all of my quasi energies are just zero. It's one big flat band, nothing interesting to see here. It looks completely trivial. Like from the stroboscopic point of view, like the blades of the helicopter that Takashi showed us yesterday, nothing's moving, just sitting there, totally static. But now let's look at what happens if we start on the edge. So if we would start on this site, on the edge, then during the first step, this particle will hop to its neighbor, just as usual. On the second step, actually, it's this set of bonds that is turned on. And you see that there's nothing actually coming into this. So during the second step of the cycle, nothing at all happens to this particle because it's just not connected to any sites during that period. In the third step, it can hop to the left once again. Uh, but during the fourth step, again, that's when this set of vertical bonds is turned on and nothing happens. So the net effect over one, a different color here, uh, over one period of the drive for a particle which started on the edge is that it moved two sites to the left. And during the next period, it would move two more sites to the left. So we can see that we've explicitly constructed now a chiral edge state, it moves only in one direction. There's no mode that moves to the right along this edge. Uh, and it's moving to the left, so that means there's a negative velocity. And so the quasi energy dispersion of that chiral mode looks like this, very similar to what we saw for the Thalys pump yesterday, which is a one dimensional system. Okay. Uh, and if we would start on the bottom edge, we would find actually that there's an edge mode that goes the other way. If we start on this site over that four steps, we'll hop two sites to the right. So what we end up with is from this very simple, you know, easy to analyze model, uh, we find that if there were no edges, if this was, if we put this system onto a torus, so there were no boundaries whatsoever, the quasi energy spectrum would just be all Floquet state, all quasi energy is equal to zero. As soon as we open up uh, boundaries, we get chiral edge states there, uh, despite the fact that I mean, not only is the bulk totally trivial, but it's just you know zero. It looks like from the stroboscopic point of view, nothing at all is happening. Okay, so this is probably the simplest illustration of this new type 
of topological phase that can occur in a driven system which has no analog in equilibrium and you can see it has no analog because really this property of quasi energy winding is really manifest here in these chiral edge states that wrap all the way around the quasi energy Brill one zone. Uh, and these types of edge states go often under the name of anomalous edge states because there's something which is unusual from the equilibrium point of view. So we had a few questions up till this point yesterday uh, about symmetries, also during uh, Takashi's talk. Uh, and so here, there are no symmetries other than time translation symmetry of the drive, but all of this can be generalized uh, to include, for example, time reversal symmetry, particle hole symmetry. Uh, you know, you can have spatial symmetries as well. It can be formulated for bosons. There's even a version of it for energy pumping. Uh, and so these papers, which I put down here, are all references. If you're interested, you can go look at uh, and see how these ideas can be manifested in different uh, scenarios. But all I'll be talking about now, just for the sake of keeping the discussion hopefully clear and simple, is uh, situations where there's no additional symmetries protecting us. Uh, so we don't have to worry about that. OK, so now we need to talk about disorder a little bit. Uh, which maybe seems like an unusual twist, uh, but it's actually very important. So, so often disorder is kind of maybe viewed as an annoyance. Uh, sometimes in a discussion about topological phases, uh, one of the interesting or robust features about a topological phase that's emphasized is the fact that if you add disorder, like to the quantum Hall effect, it doesn't uh, destroy any you know, nice quantized observables that you may want to see. Uh, now it turns out that here for these topologic these new types of topological okay states or uh, phases, disorder is actually essential to really reveal the true nature uh, of what's topological here. So it's kind of unavoidable. We need to talk about disorder a little bit, and that'll help us to understand better what's going on in this phase and what's really topological about it, and what's the invariant we can even calculate. Uh, to distinguish different phases uh, in this flow case context. Uh, okay, so question was, is disorder our friend, a foe, or a frenemy, something that we kind of love but hate? Uh, and I hope by the end of this, we'll see that it's really our friend. Uh, it's very important, uh, very important feature of the system, and uh, it's not so bad to deal, about, deal with it. Okay, so, so what do we need to know about disorder for the purpose of this discussion? It obviously can get very, uh, go in many directions with it. Uh, so the key point that I wanna bring up first here is that uh, if we have particle moving in the presence of disorder, this could be just some random potential acting on a particle that's otherwise in free space or on top of a particle moving in a lattice. Uh, there are two possibilities for what the eigenstates of this particle may look like. They could either be uh, localized or extended. Uh, and so, so what I mean is we have this uh, you know, disorder potential here. So for an extended state, maybe you studied at some point in quantum mechanics class, the WKB approximation, which is a way of so semi-classical approximation where you have a wave and its wavelength just kind of, if we have a slowly varying potential in space, the wavelength can just adapt uh, and the particle can keep propagating. So maybe we'd have a short wavelength and when the potential gets larger, the particle goes slower. So its momentum goes down and then it speeds up again and it slows down and, and so forth. It's still a wave, uh, but it's not just a plane wave. It's somehow modulated and helps this particle get through this disordered landscape. Uh, so that would be an extended state. If, the, if we find that the eigenstates of this potential have that property, it'd be extended. The other possibility is that we end up with localized states, which live maybe in one potential well of this, this uh, disordered landscape. They may spread across many. What's important is that in the extended case, uh, the wave function amplitude stays finite as you go you know, arbitrarily far away uh, in this potential, whereas for a localized state, it decays uh, typically at least exponentially uh, around some point, and then we'd have many localized states centered at different positions. So this is the case of localized states. Uh, in one dimension, it turns out that any amount of disorder localizes all of the eigenstates, 
But uh, in higher dimensions, there are different possibilities having extended versus localized states. Uh, and the key feature of this um, anomalous Floquet insulator, which we're discussing in 2D here, or in, uh, as described here, is that, in fact, if we add a small amount of potential disorder, means that the energy when the particle sits on different sites is just sort of random instead of being the same everywhere. We find that all of the Floquet eigenstates, at least as the bulk, uh, become localized. Uh, and the full argument to see that is rather technical and long, but you can read about it here. But we can kind of see it already, at least in this very simple picture here. Uh, you know, if, if we imagine this particle just moves around this plaquette, and then after those four steps, we just put a random potential on every site while it sits there, that'll disorder the energies. They'll get all kinds of you know, random values depending where the particle is sitting. Uh, but still, the eigenstates will be localized on particular sites. So that's sort of a cartoon of it, even if we tune away from this very special limit of those perfectly timed hoppings, we'll find uh, as laid out in this paper that the eigenstates remain localized. Um, okay, so let's, hopefully we can accept that as a fact for the moment uh, and ask about the consequences. What can we learn from these localized states? Uh, and there's an interesting property of Floquet states, which I haven't emphasized too much so far, which is the, mo the micro motion associated with them. So remember, uh, we solve the Floquet problem. There's a stroboscopic part where you know, the quasi energies characterize for us the stroboscopic states. And we also have some snapshots of the uh, Floquet eigenstates in the stroboscopic sense. But if we look, at times in between you know, each full driving period, those states have some motion through the Hilbert space. That's so-called micro motion. Uh, and if we have a localized state as our stroboscopic Floquet eigenstate, we can ask about various properties of it. And one, which is a particular interest here, is its magnetization or orbital moment. So this, we know that before and after one complete period of the driving, this localized state is in some position in space. But in between, it may move around. Uh, it may just wiggle back and forth, or it may actually move in a loop and encircle some amount of area. And if you think about a charged particle that moves in a loop, uh, that's like a current loop and it generates a magnetic moment. So there's a connection between this micro motion uh, and magnetization, in fact. So we can try to characterize the localized Floquet eigenstates in terms of the magnetizations that they carry. Um, and very similar to what you would expect from eigenstates of a Hamiltonian, where the magnetization of a given eigenstate corresponds to the derivative of its energy with respect to magnetic field, because it's basically seeing you know, the energy coupling between magnetic field and magnetic moment. In fact, if you average over one complete period of the drive, the same relation holds for Floquet states uh, in terms of the quasi-energy dependence on an applied magnetic field. Okay, so there's actually a really sort of interesting property about the magnetization of the Floquet eigenstates in this new topological uh, phase that we we're discussing, which is in fact that the average magnetization of one of the localized states is actually quantized. Uh, and we can see it. You can give a very technical argument, but instead I want to give you a physical argument that I think helps us see it uh, in relatively simple terms. And it follows just from two facts. So let's suppose, uh, or maybe three facts, depending on how we count. Suppose we have finite system, just some rectangle, uh, and you know we're, we're driving it in the way I described before uh, that gets us into this phase where uh, we have chiral edge states, but the bulk turn numbers would be zero. Uh, and then imagine that I put one fermionic particle on every single site of this lattice. And let's ignore spins, suppose they're all spin up or whatever it is. Uh, so one thing we know is that if we have a fermion on every single site, there can be no current flowing on any of the bonds because for any, any bond that I look at, 
uh, either you can think about it that it's poly blocked. There's no way for any electron to move. They're all locked in place. Or by hermeticity, when any hopping is on, one electron is moving to the right, one is to the left. They always exactly cancel. So when all sites are filled, there's no current flowing anywhere. Uh, but we also know something else, which is that there is a chiral edge state that runs around the boundary here. Uh, and the current carried by this chiral edge state is uh, one electron per period crossed through any point here, because as we discussed yesterday, uh, coming back here, remember for uh, a quasi energy band that winds all the way around the Brill one zone, as we saw for the Taoist pump, uh, when it's completely filled, every single mode along this uh, branch is, is filled, uh, the average velocity was quantized and the, the density also is tied to that, uh, which gives us a quantized current that flows of one particle per driving period. Okay, so what this tells us is we know that this edge mode is filled, it's carrying this amount of current. Uh, so, so edge modes carries uh, current loop, this current of one particle per driving period. Uh, but since the current vanishes everywhere, uh, that means that those bulk states, which are oscillating, we saw it very explicitly uh, just by watching over one period of the drive, how each particle moves around a plaquette, uh, you see that they are actually moving in the opposite sense. Uh, so that it must be that the uncompensated magnetization from those uh, you know, circulating localized states in the bulk exactly cancels this loop current here. Uh, and so if we use Ampere's law, which says that the magnetic moment is the current times the area. So we have this current loop here formed by the edge state times its area. That tells us that there is a compensate and then, sorry, I lost my train of thought. So this is from the, uh, from the edge state. There must be a compensating magnetization. Magnetization of minus I times A from all both states. And that means that uh, for each state of the bulk, there's one per unit area, one per lattice site essentially. That means that the magnetization per state on average should be exactly equal to minus whatever this current was, one over T. Okay, so, so from this argument, we actually see that although each of these localized states is a little bit different because the disorder landscape changes them depending on where they're sitting, uh, on average, actually, each of them has to carry exactly minus one over the driving period of magnetization so that in total, the magnetization of all the bulk states can cancel the magnetization of the edge state. Uh, so maybe it wasn't the most beautiful explanation at the moment, but what this actually shows us is that the magnetization of these bulk Floquet eigenstates uh, is actually a topological invariant. Uh, remember the one which is up here is basically the winding number of this edge state. It told us by analogy of the Thales pump, you know, how much current flows, how many times that edge state winds around the quasi-energy zone as k goes from zero to two pi. Uh, and so the magnetization is tied to that. Uh, and this, you know, so although the churn number is zero, so there's nothing that we can calculate from the stroboscopic Floquet eigenstates to characterize topology here. By looking at the micro motion, that's where the topology is hidden. Uh, and in this case, it's actually the magnetization, the average magnetization we need to calculate. And that's what really distinguishes this phase from a trivial insulator 
which would also have turn number zero stroboscopically, but there'd be no micromotion whatsoever, or maybe the, you know, each particle wiggles back and forth, but it doesn't encircle any actual area to give a magnetization. So that's what characterizes this phase. Uh, any question on that? Does yeah, does it hand uh, say it? Yes, I have a question. Um, so uh, if you have a start with the model that you have originally uh, a magnetic order in the system, right? So here you don't talk about any spin in the bulk, but if your bulk has a magnetic order, does that uh, perturbation, uh, it's gonna break down this uh, sort of quantization of the magnetization? Okay, that's a good question. So I, I yeah, thank you. So I said, let's you know forget about spin, and we just focused on the orbital magnetization of this sort of center of mass motion of each of these localized states. Uh, if you also have spin, then of course spin has a magnetic moment associated with it, uh, and that would be on top of this. So uh, it's really just just this uh, orbital part of the sort of center of mass motion of each localized state, which is quantized, and there's another piece which would come from spin uh, if you're talking about spinful particles. Yeah, and a spinful particle, so that case also going to be uh, quantized as well because of this micromotion or? Well, if you just think about electrons and they just have random spins, then um, you know there's nothing special about it. If they're all completely spin polarized, then it just adds uh, you know a Bohr magneton per electron on top of this. And that's also quantized if they're all pointing in the same direction because each, each spin is a specific amount. Um, I see. Maybe one more quick one, and then others, we can hold it for the end so we can move forward. Uh, yeah, so the first four step you discussed, there are some hoppings are non-zero, but other hoppings are zero, right? So if instead of the zero hoppings, you turn on small amount of hoppings, in that case, what will happen? This whole picture will valid or the break, it will break down? Yeah, thanks. Let me... It's a good chance for me to clarify that. So, so this picture that I gave is one very specific fine-tuned limit of a phase of matter. Uh, so here, you're right that some hoppings are non-zero and some are exactly zero, and that allowed us to analyze it and see for this specific case, you know, everything that's happening. Uh, but in general, uh, the phase exists even if all the hoppings are on okay. same time, varying degrees. And instead of having uh, this very simple dispersion, which was just flat at zero plus the edge states, uh, in that case, you would get something that looks more like, like this, with two, two individual bands and churn numbers, uh, which are zero, yet edge states flowing between them. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, good, so if there are others, maybe we can talk about it after at the questions at the end, just wanna make sure we have time to discuss uh, many body dynamics, because there have been many questions that have popped up uh, during the talks, all the talks so far, uh, and hopefully some of the comments I can, whoops, sorry, I turned off my iPad. <laughs> uh, some of the, uh, what I want to talk about now, hopefully can address some of those questions and also give you some food for thought uh, if you want to move forward. Uh, so, so the question which has come up in various forms is one of, you know, We've talked a lot about single particle Floquet states. We can solve the Floquet problem. Takashi explained to us about this uh, space-time picture, which gives us a nice theoretical framework for solving that problem. Uh, but we've completely left open the question of, in an actual physical system, which of those Floquet states are populated and which are empty, and you know what decides, who decides that? Uh, and the fact of the matter is its situation is a lot more complex than it is in equilibrium uh, because in equilibrium we have some we have statistical mechanics and there's some very powerful rules uh entropy maximization energy minimization free energy minimization uh none of that applies in the context of the driven system uh we don't have detailed balance uh more generally we have some system it's being driven by zeus or whoever uh Energy can flow into the system from the drive. It can also flow back out. Generally, there's a bath there. Energy can flow out to the bath. Uh, there can be, in, in equilibrium, it's always the case that the transition rates between any pair of levels exactly cancel each other. That's called detailed balance. In a non-equilibrium system, there can be loops where we have, say, three levels 
Uh, it's a steady state because none of the populations are changing, but actually there's current flowing in some loops. All kinds of interesting stuff can happen. Uh, so on the one hand, it's much less universal than equilibrium. It's much more complicated, but on the bright side, it gives us a lot of opportunities. Whereas in equilibrium, the steady state or equilibrium state of the system depends only on a couple of macroscopic state variables, chemical potential, temperature, pressure, and that's it. In the non-equilibrium case, the steady state in general depends on all kinds of details of the density of states of the bath, the form of the system bath coupling, uh, all that enters. Uh, and that gives opportunities actually for engineering specific types of states and trying to realize uh, you know, interesting new phenomena that way. So it's some new knobs that we have at our disposal. So on the one hand, we, we need to use them because we have to somehow control. If we want to realize some interesting new type of non-equilibrium phenomenon or topological flow case state, whatever it is, we have to steer the system to realize the right type of many body state to observe that phenomenon. Uh, but we have some new knobs at our disposal to help us get there. And that's what I want to discuss. Um, so we need some strategies to make sure that the system, you know, the correct states of the system get occupied to be able to see what it is that we're looking for. Uh, if we don't do anything, I think maybe Takashi mentioned it yesterday, if we just have an isolated system and it's interacting and you drive it, then the only thing really that tends to happen is that, you know, like putting a cup of water in the microwave, uh, it just heats up over time. It absorbs lots of energy and eventually you boil off all your water uh, and there's nothing left to drink. Uh, and that's what would happen here. So we need something to help us. And there's a few different strategies we can look into. Uh, one is if we actually consider an open system, so we, we're driving, you know, as in a solid state, it's always actually any physical system is always open. Uh, maybe there's phonons in the environment. The system may be coupled to some reservoirs or leads. Uh, that will lead to some kind of steady state. And then we have to think possibly about tailoring the couplings to the, to the environment to help steer the system into a desired state. Um, topic, and I'll discuss more about that briefly. Uh, a topic that I won't discuss further, but there's some nice references here, is that uh, with disorder, uh, there is a phase of many body localization, which may be realized where the system actually stops absorbing energy from the drive and you can realize potentially some very interesting behavior for, for long times uh, through this many body localization phenomenon that you know, keeps the system from heating up too much. Uh, and the last, which has a connection to the high frequency driving limit that Takashi was talking about, is that uh, from a practical point of view, uh, we don't necessarily need to demand that there's an interesting steady state of the system uh, if we can just manage to stabilize it for a long enough time to do an experiment. Because every experiment only takes a finite amount of time. A graduate student only has a few years before they you know, graduate and go do something else. Uh, so if we have some way of delaying uh, some eventual you know, evaporation of the system, uh, that's good enough too. Uh, and so let me start with there, uh, because this is the simplest thing to sort of describe and think about, and then we'll move to thinking about this uh, open systems and what are the main considerations there. So I just wanted to be sure to mention the high frequency driving regime because it's discussed a lot in the literature and it's been very important for understanding a lot about okay systems, particularly in cold atom context, the high, high frequency limit is, is used quite a bit. And conceptually, it's very nice. So, so what happens in high frequency driving, uh, from the point of, so Takashi told us what high frequency expansion looks like for the flow case states. But now if we just kind of step back and ask about energy absorption and what, what it's gonna do to the state of the system if we allow interactions between the particles, uh, what high frequency means, you know, high or low, it's a relative term. You always have to say relative to something. Uh, so in this case, what I mean is the frequency is high such that the energy of one photon of this drive is much bigger than the energy of any single excitation in the system. So suppose I have some bandwidth, let's call it W, uh, an H bar omega of the drive much bigger than W. That means that any single particle just getting excited within its band uh, won't 
take up enough energy to actually absorb one full photon. We may have to have some very high order process where you know 10 or 20 particles get excited just for one photon to be absorbed. Uh, and the higher that order of that process has to be, if you think about perturbation theory, the lower the probability or the lower the rate. So as we keep increasing the frequency here, uh, meaning that the minimum amount of energy that can be absorbed, which is h bar omega, is going to require a larger and larger number of particles to rearrange what they're doing, that's going to become a very slow process. So uh, you know, we can look here in these papers for some rigorous you know, arguments discussing exactly how that affects the rate. But the basic physical picture is this. And what it means is that if we can work in this high frequency driving limit, if that's appropriate for whatever you know, phase or phenomenon you're looking for, uh, that can stabilize the system for a very long time. Eventually, the system will start absorbing energy, and, and then you may lose it. But uh, it might give you a time window, which is good enough. Uh, so that's the high frequency driving limit. Uh, one drawback, not drawback, which is sort of limitation, let's say, of thinking about high frequencies, is that all of the phenomena, let's say the topological phenomena of Floquet systems, which don't have any analogs in equilibrium, uh, actually require the frequency not to be too high, because we need somehow the drive to be playing an important role. If the frequency is very high, and the system mostly just sees its average, and it's not really playing a major role. But if you remember how uh, we got, sorry to back up on you, uh, how we got into this new kind of anomalous topological phase, we needed the driving frequency actually to connect the top and bottom of these two bands to close the gap and reopen it. So by definition, the frequency had to be comparable to the bandwidth. There's no way to realize this at high frequencies. So high frequencies are nice. Sometimes they can help us, but not always. So now we got to move on to talk about what happens when we don't get to work in the high frequency limit. Okay, so now I want to talk about Floquet system, which is being driven periodically in time, and it's open, meaning it's connected to an environment. Um, and there are many different types of environments we could consider. And just for the sake of discussion, I want to consider it's a non-interacting system, back to non-interacting particles, but coupled to Fermi reservoirs, like leads. So you know, leads are nice in, a non in an equilibrium setting. They do two things for us. First of all, the chemical potential of the leads sets for us also the chemical potential in the system. So we know what the equilibrium state would be at zero bias. So for example, you know, if the chemical potential of a lead here, this is representing the Fermi C of the lead, chemical potential is set somewhere in the gap of this material over here, then we know it's going to be in an insulating state. Um, and then we can also use the leads by applying a bias to probe the system and you know, by transport measurements, see is it an insulator is, or not, is current uh, flow or not. Okay, so that's what we get from connecting the system to leads. Now let's think for a moment what happens if we try to do this with a periodically driven system. Uh, you know, okay, we can shine our laser, whatever it is here. Um, and now inside the sample, instead of energy eigenstates, we have Floquet states, which have quasi-energy uh, as their eigenvalues. But now there's a question because, as has come up many times, this quasi energy uh, has some non uniqueness to it. You know, we had some choices to make in where we decided to place our quasi energy Brillouin zone. Uh, this band here, which looks like the top, if I would have picked a different choice for my quasi energy zone, could have been the lower band. Uh, and so this, it's not clear actually how do I match up quasi energies? to real energies, which are in the environment. And that's going to be important for, this, for trying to figure out which states, of the, which Floquet states are filled and which are empty. Um, so although the quasi-energy picture was very useful for exploring new aspects of topology in Floquet systems, uh, it actually kind of makes things a little bit cloudy when we try to think about how does the Floquet system interact with its path. And for this reason, I want to introduce a different quantity, which already appeared in Takashi's talk when he talked about the unfolded Floquet picture. Uh, and I'll give you the more uh, you know, technical definition of what that quantity was he was actually plotting. 
Uh, and I also want to you know, recognize this point that this, so this quantity, which is called the time average spectral function, uh, this is an object which I really came to appreciate uh, after reading Luis's papers uh, you know, in the early days, uh, where they had plotted this unfolded spectrum uh, in terms of this quantity. And over time, I really realized how much use we can get out of it in understanding better uh, open flow case systems. So the idea is the following. We have a flow case state. This is just coming from flow case theorem. We can decompose it in terms of this phase that winds in time according to the quasi energy. Uh, and then the time periodic part expanded in terms of the Floquet harmonics here. Um, and from this, we can construct this time average spectral function, which has in it uh, a bunch of delta function peaks uh, at energies, which are the quasi energy itself, plus integer multiples of the driving field photon energy. So we have this whole series of peaks. Um, and what you see is that these peaks, you know, they're separated by integer multiples of h bar omega. So from a quasi energy point of view, they're actually all identical. But what the spectral function has done is spread them back out and weighted them uh, according to the normalization or the amplitudes squared uh, of all these different Fourier harmonics, which make up the Floquet state. Uh, and what's really important about this is although the quasi energy has some arbitrariness to it, we could have picked any one of these actual values of energy and set that as our quasi energy by our choice of you know, branch cut or however we had done it. Uh, there's nothing arbitrary about this spectral function. No matter which choice I took for my quasi energy Brill one zone, this physical information contained in the time average spectral function uh, will stay the same. So if I would have declared this is epsilon and this was epsilon minus h bar omega, the peaks would have been identical. Uh, and that will tell me now with no uncertainty whatsoever, no ambiguity, how this flow case state couples to its environment. So to take an example, and fortunately, Takashi even already showed this picture. So this is the time average spectral function now for graphene subject to circularly polarized light. Uh, let's focus on this chiral edge state that appeared in the gap that opened around the Dirac points when circularly polarized light was applied to the system. Uh, if we consider part of this edge state, which is below zero, so suppose, I don't know what this red box is here, suppose chemical potential of our lead is exactly at zero in equilibrium, then for a state which was at a negative energy, we would know that it would get filled because it's connected to filled states of the Fermi C in the lead. Uh, a state which was above the chemical potential of the lead, it would be empty because there'd be empty states and you know, whatever started in the system could just flow out. But here what we see is if we look at the spectral function for this Floquet state, not only does it have a central peak here at negative energy where electrons can flow in from the lead, but sidebands have formed at energies which are both lower and higher. So the component of this flow case state, which is actually above the Fermi energy of the lead, gives a possibility for particles to leak back out. So it's no longer the case that just by coupling this flow case system to a lead, that uh, all the states with quasi energies below the chemical potential will be filled and those above empty. In fact, the steady state population will be uh, determined by the balance between the incoming and outgoing rates. Uh, and so states above the chemical potential will be you know, somewhat filled, states below will be slightly empty. There isn't a nice Fermi distribution there. Uh, and moreover, on top of that, if you apply a small bias, the way that the occupation or the populations change won't be uh, you know, as direct as it is in equilibrium. And that means that the arguments that would tell us uh, in an equilibrium setting that applying a tiny bias gives a certain amount of current uh, with a constant of proportionality, which is E squared over H in the quantized Hall effect, those arguments actually don't work out anymore because of these uh, extra features. And we don't expect to see perfect quantized transport uh, in the Floquet system, even if we manage to create chiral edge states and make it look close to uh, you know, quantized Hall kind of band structure. Uh, now, the extent to which quantization is spoiled 
depends on the intensities of these sidebands uh, and also various features of the coupling at you know, different energies between the system and the leads. Uh, so there are ways of trying to tailor this to get as close to quantization as possible, but it is never perfect. So you know, we can get something that's close, but not quite the same uh, as equilibrium in this way. Um, Oh yeah, sorry, said that part already. Um, okay, so now if we ask sort of more generally, what happens, suppose, you know, we think about a solid state system and maybe it's coupled to the lead or a Fermi reservoir. Also, there are phonons in the system. Uh, there can be uh, coupling to electromagnetic modes of the environment. There's all kinds of different processes which may occur. I just want to highlight a few of them just to give you an idea of what goes on. And again, it's useful to work in this unfolded picture, or this picture thinking about the time average spectral function, which is what I've here just illustrated by hand for us in a simpler picture so we can visualize. Um, okay, so this would have this is a picture that comes from, uh, you know, imagine that we started with a two band. system e versus k uh, and applied a driving frequency omega to it so you can see that the original conduction band and valence band are here but thinking about this space-time picture as Takashi explained we've shifted the bands up and down and, and now these gaps have opened here and you can see some kind of remnants uh, of say the valence band shifted up a various amount of times uh, so one thing to keep in mind is even though we've unfolded this spectrum and it looks like now we have many bands, we haven't actually changed the dimension of the Hilbert space. So there's only two bands still here. So we wanna think about how these states are populated uh, for each K. So if I look at the valence band, uh, I have to think about the same population in, in every copy. It just gets copied as an image uh, over and over again, but I can ask about all the different processes at play. So for example, say there's an electron here in this blue state here, that is actually an electron occupying a state which is very similar to the original conduction band. Uh, and if you had that, forgetting anything but a drive, just in a you know, non-driven system, you put an extra electron in the conduction band, you would expect it would just relax, emit a photon and, and you know, join with a hole that was in the valence band. So one process we can expect to occur is this electron hole recombination. Um, and, you know, also, sorry, uh, other things that can occur, this electron, which has some empty states below it, it could say emit a phonon and relax that way, or we can have a phonon, you know, this, this particle that was up here, it may leave, by going back to the lead or it may emit a phonon and come down here. So what I wanna say is there's a whole slew of different processes which are going on. Uh, and whereas in equilibrium, as I mentioned earlier, you know, all we would need to know is chemical potential, temperature, and we'd be done and we'd know what the steady state is. The only way to find out what the steady state of this Floquet system is, is to consider the competition between all these different transition rates uh, and see how they come out. So, you know, on the one hand, it sounds like mess. Uh, on the other hand, this picture in terms of the time average spectral function uh, gives us a way of visualizing all these different processes uh, and understanding certain features of them because the intensity of this line, actually, when we go calculate the transition rate is what controls the matrix element. So for example, a process where I want to scatter from uh, say this, state here into this remnant of the valence band that was shifted up here, uh, that will be suppressed relative to uh, a rate coming into the conduction band here because uh, the amplitude of this side band is very small, similar to what we saw over here for coupling to the lead. If we have a very small amplitude, that means all our matrix elements are small and, and rates are correspondingly small. So these are the sort of physical considerations that go into it. There have been many works uh, you know, trying to analyze this problem, understand the character of the steady states. It's a wide open problem. There are many 
uh, you know, features still to uh, explore, and also uh, the question of how to engineer these couplings to steer the system towards uh, nice looking or useful steady states. Uh, that's a very active and interesting direction. Um, just to end on a sort of cleaner note, let's say, uh, the last thing I want to mention before breaking for questions is that there are some very specific uh, fine-tuned conditions under which uh, the steady state actually will look like an equilibrium state, but in terms of quasi-energies instead of real energies. Uh, and this actually, surprisingly, look at the date here, goes all the way back to the 1970s uh, in the Soviet Union when there were lots of papers written about semiconductors and you know, optical uh, manipulation of them. Uh, so if you're so lucky that there is a rotating frame transformation, some unitary time-dependent transformation that you can apply to the system, which makes this time-dependent time Hamiltonian time-independent in the rotating frame. And on top of that, it also leaves the bath and system bath coupling Hamiltonians also time independent in the rotating frame. It's a very special situation. It's not generic, but when that happens, then in the rotating frame, it looks like an effective equilibrium problem. And then in this rotating frame, the steady state will be of the usual equilibrium Gibbs form. And in fact, the energies in the rotating frame are the quasi energies of that problem. So this is a really nice limit, uh, and it's kind of a target if you want to think about how can we see uh, topological phenomena of, you know, in Floquet topological insulator, we need to somehow get the system close to this Floquet Gibbs form. Uh, and generally, we won't exactly have this property, but we can try to engineer the environment to get us as close as possible to it. And so that's you know, one of the goals uh, heading towards realization of these phenomena in real systems is figuring out how can we get closer uh, to such a steady state. Okay, so I think this is a, you know, time is up basically. So let me just stop there and say that, you know, hopefully we've seen the topology and driven systems is very rich uh, and interesting and gives us some more opportunities compared to non-driven systems. Uh, and some open questions that I promised for those who wanna, you know, get your hands dirty and work in this field. Uh, is thinking about, for example, strongly correlated Floquet many body states, not just single particle or states that are you know, connected to single particle states, but how can we stabilize truly strongly correlated Floquet states, which maybe are, again, distinct from anything that we can find in equilibrium. Uh, identifying promising platforms, materials, bath engineering methods is a very important um, problem. And also one theoretical question, you know, for equilibrium, we have the variational principle. If someone comes to you with two candidate ground states, you can say which one's better just by calculating the energy and take the lower one. But we don't have a principle like that for Floquet states. We need some kind of general principles if once we start talking about interacting systems, correlated systems, if somebody proposes multiple possible steady states, how can we even decide which is the right one from a theoretical point of view? Uh, and so this is some area that needs to be developed further. So let me pause there and uh, take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, uh, Mark. Excellent, excellent talk. Uh, it's really great morning. Let's go to questions. We have uh, a question by Ilana, right? Yes, thanks. This was really excellent. Um, I had a question about the churn number of these topologically insulating systems. So if you turn on this periodic potential, are you changing the churn number or, or does it just, um, I guess that's it. Yeah, does it change the churn number? <laughs> yeah, good question. So, so actually for that, to answer that, let me just make a distinction because there, there was actually some, there was a paper a while ago uh, kind of related to this. There's, there's a churn number of a band uh, which we can define independent of whether any particles are even there at all. Some sort of abstract thing. And we can also think about a churn number of a state, which has to do with you know, which modes are actually occupied. Uh, so in terms of the flow case states themselves, uh, suppose we started here with these churn numbers, which were one and minus one, we turn on the drive uh, and the flow case states have different churn numbers than they did before the drive or even 
maybe both were with the drive, but we changed the frequency and we changed the churn number of the band. The separate question is if you started and you had a topological insulator, quantum anomalous hull insulator, whatever it was, say you had you know field valence band, empty conduction band, you turn on the drive. Uh, if it's an isolated system, the dynamics are completely unitary. Uh, there's actually uh, a no-go theorem. I don't have the reference here. Sorry, I can find it if you email me. Uh, that tells us that you can't change the churn number of that state uh, by unitary evolution. Uh, you need something, dis you need some dissipation actually to allow the state to adapt to the new topology or the new churn numbers of the bands. So I hope that answered the question. So can it like break inversion symmetry to turn on these full K bands? You can break any symmetry by a drive in principle, yeah. All right, thank you. But here there were no symmetries, but if you had it, the drive could break it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we will switch a bit. Uh, we have a question by Bo Leng that was, uh, uh, I kept it here. Mm. Oh, hi, Mark. Hi. Uh, yeah, I, I, I really like your uh, AFI paper. And oh. uh, yeah, our group realized the uh, photonic analog of your hopping. And uh, so the biggest question in our field is that the this integer change, like, uh, there, there has no, never been measured experimentally. So when I see your, uh, you can measure the winding number that is associated with uh, uh, magnetization, which mm -hmm. is like a integer change, a robust uh, experimental quant uh, quantity. So I was, I was uh, really interested in this slide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so you you uh, can you go to the formula for when you calculate the uh, magnetization? Yeah, yeah, this one. So your your uh phi phi state is uh k s k y and t right, but your uh your magnetization uh op operator is uh, r and uh, uh del t of r. So do you need to have like a vanier representation to first convert uh your flow case state to to the from k space to to the spatial space? Um, a couple of things I wanted to respond to. So, so one actually, I guess, so so this magnetization, we need the dis disorder to localize the states to be able to you know, really measure this orbital moment. Uh, so K is not really a good quantum number anymore. We just have some index in, uh, but with regard to R and DRDT, uh, you know, we could have rather have put momentum there. So really magnetization, this orbital moment, it's really the orbital angular momentum, L, R cross P. Uh, so you know, that's, that's really what we're calculating here is the time averaged orbital angular momentum of this uh, you know, localized wave packet as it moves around. Great. So let's uh, uh, we'll have more offline if you want to. Sorry, it's, uh, it's me, Luis. Thank you, Mark. Hi, hi. Uh, a nice pre presentation and uh, more clear and good physical explanations. <laughs> uh, congratulations! Look, uh, just a comment about you mentioned at the end of, of your talk about the urban problems uh, in the realm of disorder and many body phenomena. Uh, as you know, one classical example is the Anderson localization, right? in many body systems with yeah. disorder. And, uh, but this is occurs in equilibrium systems. Uh, your comment about the current investigations on the localizations in flow case systems uh, in the context of many body localizations uh, in point of uh, taking in mind that point that you called about general principles. Did you listen to me? What was the question? Can I comment on it? Is that what you said? Uh, the connection uh, in, the, uh, so, in the phenomena out of equilibrium. So as far as Anderson localization is concerned, meaning localization of local eigenstates without interactions, that's you know established. Uh, as far as many body localization is concerned, uh, meaning uh, localization in the presence of interactions between the particles, uh, what I can say is that uh, Floquet many-body localization is 
as established as many body localization as equilibrium, but there's still debate whether many body localization even works in equilibrium. Uh, but regardless of whether it's you know, this true localization or it's only close to it, uh, from a practical point of view, uh, in either case, we can expect that something which is close to a localized state will have some very long, whether it's exactly localized or not, there would be some very long time scale associated with it when we can still study it and see whatever we want to see. Um, so there's been actually a lot of work already on that, uh, including by ourselves on this anomalous Floquet insulator, showing that it's robust to interactions on the same level that many body localization is established even in equilibrium. Right, right. Th thank you for your comment. Thanks for the question. Let's move to a very last uh, short question by uh, please by Srimaye. So my question is, Mark, uh, that picture, the phi equals to zero, char number equals to zero, and you get those anomalous H states. And now uh, let's say in some problem, you get a rotating wave approximation, uh, means you, you find some rotating wave kind of approximation and go to one uh, frame where the mod, uh, be, means model becomes your uh, time independent. And now they are the, if this quasi energy you can map to the real energy in that rotating frame. So there and calculate the char number for those uh, states in rotating frame, what will you find C equals to zero or C means what? The char number will remain zero for that rotating frame also? Um, good, so in the rotating frame, uh, the flo stroboscopic floquet states will still be the same as they were. And since the churn number is defined uh, on the stroboscopic floquet states, they, they won't, they'll be the same, basically. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So yeah. um, I, I, I think we have to, um, we have to conclude a lot of, lot of questions. Thanks a lot, Mark, once again, for, for, for the very nice uh, talks. Thanks also to Takashi. We will make a very brief uh, break of four minutes, and then we will be back for the last talk that will be Xavier and Thomas. Okay, thanks, Luis. And I don't know if there's anything left in the chat, I'll, I'll answer on there. Uh, I'll be around. Sure, sure, sure. sure. We, can, we can keep going. So thanks a lot. Three minutes, and, and we come back. <laughs> 